verse 2, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moshe's wife, Zephorah, after he had sent her away, and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the other was named Elazur. For he said, The Elohim, the God of my father, was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Then Jethro, or Yithro, Moshe's father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moshe in the wilderness where he was camped at the Mount of Elohim, at the Mount of God, Mount Sinai. And he sent word to Moshe, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Then Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. He believed in the Scripture in the New Testament, even though it hadn't been written been written yet to greet one another with a holy kiss that's right, amen. how did he know that it hadn't been written yet because that's the, the respect they have for one another amen and they asked each other of their welfare that's what they want to know how you've been doing what's been going on in your life is everything well with you and went into the tent and Moshe told, told his father-in-law all that Yodevate the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey. Did you hear that? Moshe is not, you know, he's not cutting no slack. He's being straightforward and honest. He's saying, we had a lot of hardship on this journey. When we left Egypt and God delivered us, we didn't just, everything went just smooth. Nothing happened. Nothing bad happened. He said, we had a lot of hardship. But he's sharing how that Elohim, God, had delivered them through all this hardship. You understand we're going to have hardship along the journey sometimes. But if we're trusting in Him, He'll be faithful and just to deliver us through all the hardship. Okay? So don't be expecting this journey to be a piece of pie. Amen? Expect to get a piece of pie sometime in the midst of the hardship. When you see a pie laying over, reach in and grab you a piece because next time you might not get one next week. It might be a little more difficult to get to that pie. Okay? Hallelujah. And Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which Yodavave had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. They were rejoicing. Hallelujah. God's delivered us. Amen. Amen. Now Jethro said, Blessed be Yodavave, the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yodavave, the Lord, is greater than all the gods. So Jethro is recognizing and realizing that while he's a priest of Midian and he's serving false gods, that this is a God of all gods, because really there are no other gods. Amen. He's realizing he's the all-powerful one. He realizes it because Moses is told he systematically destroyed all the false deities, all the false gods in the land of Egypt before he destroyed that nation and delivered the sons of Israel out. Amen. You realize that that was a time when God was delivering his people through the Passover offering, if you will, through the blood of the Lamb, if you will, a prerequisite of a time coming when Messiah would come and deliver all the people whosoever will trust in him through his own blood that would be shed. And so now when we have a memorial, at, which is coming up soon in the spring of the year, at the beginning of the month, according to the biblical calendar, that we do that as a memorial of his deliverance. Amen. By how? Applying the blood that he shed to the doorpost of our hearts, our life. Amen. See over there? Ket. The word ket. The doorpost and the lintel. And ket yod kai means life. Because it's in his atoning blood that's put on the doorpost of our hearts that we accept that he gave for us that we couldn't do. He paid for us. He bought us with a price that we couldn't pay back. He gives us new life. Amen. He gives us restoration. Hallelujah. He puts his spirit in us and delivers us. Amen. Amen. Changes us from all the things that some of us used to be that wasn't too good. Amen. We become Amen. a new creature, Messiah Yeshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now, I know that Yodibabha, the Lord, is greater with, than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro, or Yethro, Moshe's father-in-law, took a burnt offering and, uh, and sacrifices for Elohim, for God. And Aaron came with the elders, excuse me, with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moshe's father-in-law before Elohim. So they're all getting together, the elders of the house of Israel, they're all getting together and they're having a time, a fellowship. And it came about the next day that Moshe set to judge the people. This is going to get very, very important. You want to take some notes probably. And it came about the next day that Moshe set to judge the people. And the people stood about Moshe from morning 
until evening. I thought the Bible says we're not to judge one another. You've got to put it in the proper context. We're not to judge anybody in the world. That's not our place. All we're to do is be a light to the world, to love them, to show the goodness of Messiah is that they will repent of their sins, see the Messiah, and come into the household of faith. But judgment begins where? First, at the household of God. Amen. God's not going to judge the world before he judges the household of God and gets us straightened out first. Right. Amen. Amen. So we've got to get our lives straightened out. And there is judgment within the body of Messiah by the ones who are there to judge. Why? To, we'll see as we go through this, so there'll be fair treatment. There'll be equity, justice among all the people of God. Amen. Amen. we got all these judges out here today. You know, all the things that are going on in the world, there's hopefully for the most part, Right justice rendered out when you go before a judge, but sometimes there's not. Yeah, right. I hate to say it, but sometimes there's people in prison that shouldn't be there. Amen. And sometimes there's people that should be there that's not there. Amen. Okay, we're dealing with humanity, all right? Now, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone, key here is why do you alone, by yourself, sit as a judge, and all the people stand about you from morning until evening. Moses must have been pretty tough. He's hearing all the problems, all the difficulties, all the, uh, he did this to me, uh, she did that to me, or on and on and on, what's your render, what's your judgment? And Moshe said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to also inquire of Elohim of God. And that's there too, and that's good. When they have a dispute, it comes to me too. And I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of Elohim and his laws, his Torah, his instructions, his statutes. Because we're going to see a nation here that's being formed out of a nation, Mitzrayim, and God's going to instant, and God's going to place his statutes, his judgments, his laws within this nation, within this nation so we righteous judgment for everybody, equality for everybody. No respect for persons. Not respect a persons in our ideal, okay? Because a lot of people get that wrong. The ideal of respect a persons is, well, you, you're showing them, uh, you're, you're treating that person better than me. But the ideal is that for a lot of people today, it's because someone renders right judgment and it don't go your way, you feel like you get mistreated. So how do we, how do we know what's the difference? God's word. We gotta go, God decides what is right and what is wrong. He specifically gives us what is right and what is wrong in his word and this is what we're to judge from not from our own feelings not from our own thoughts not because it's my son or my daughter or my wife but justice for everybody amen we have to understand that and moshe or moses father-in-law said to him the thing that you're doing is not good it's not that the judgment wasn't good it's not that, that was good but the way he was doing it you will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now, I want everybody to repeat after me <laughs> what I'm fixing to say. I cannot do it alone. I cannot do it alone. I need you, and you need me. I need you, and you need me. And in all this, first and foremost, in all this, first and foremost we need God. We Amen. Amen. We're here to do this together according to God's word. Okay? Now listen to me. Listen to me. That's what the scripture says. I shall give you counsel. Yethro, the father-in-law, wants to give Moshe. Moshe, the great deliverer, just delivered him from, the, from, from, from where? Egypt. A man of God. God speaks face to face with him, the only one who ever did. The rest of the prophets, he gave them his word in dreams and in visions. But yet here's Jethro, a priest of Midian, who was serving false gods before, and he's going to give him some advice. Does that seem strange at first? Don't we understand that God can use everybody? Just because everybody is not believing in his whole word doesn't mean they don't have some good counsel for us. We need to, let me tell you, I, I believe this, and I've said this before. I believe that we can learn something from everybody if we'll just listen and open our ears. We can learn something if we listen from the drunk that's on the street. It may not be much, but we can learn something that can teach us maybe how to witness to them better 
or maybe something that we felt about them that was really wrong in our heart, we need to have a little more humility in how we treat them and how we try to understand them. Amen. Now listen to me, I shall give you counsel and God will be with you. You be the people's representative before Elohim and you bring the disputes to Elohim, which that was what he was already supposed to do. Then teach them the statutes, the laws, and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. What's my job here today as your bond servant to serve him and you as the people, my brothers and sisters, to teach you as I'm taught the statutes, the ways of Elohim, so that you will know you will be discipled and you will begin to disciple others the same way. That's what it's all about. Helping one another, amen? Teaching the ways of truth so that we can have, walk in God's blessings. We don't have to be defeated by the enemy all the time, opening the door up because of our bad choices and our bad behavior because the reality is some of us have been raised in bad situations and we didn't even know what God's Word said. So we're acting on what we've seen our parents do or someone else do and it's caused us severe consequences. Now hear me carefully, that's not an excuse before God for you to continue in them, but it's a reason for you to understand that God has a better way, and we need to find out what it is and do it His way so we can walk in His blessings and deliverance. Amen. Verse 21, Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God. First of all, don't get mad at me, ladies. I want you to understand, though, it says men. In this situation, it's about men, okay? Who fear God, men of truth. The Hebrew word is emet. What is emet? It is devar. Devar emet, the word of truth. God's word of truth. Not my theory of what truth is and what my word is or yours or any other religious entity's uh, thoughts on what. It's God's word of truth, not ours. Those who hate dishonest gain. You want to be a man of God, to be chosen of God, to lead the people of God, a leader? You've got to hate dishonest gain. There's nothing wrong with righteous gain, but dishonest gain. And you shall place these over them. Remember who's given this, this leadership, this advice? Yethro's given to Moshe. You shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. And let them judge the people at all times. And let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you. But every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. Now our court system today is sort of somewhat, and I'm not getting a lot of details, sort of set like this. We got the we got the judges in the uh, in the local communities and districts and all, and then we got fi finally we got what we call a Supreme Court. If something doesn't get worked out and it's really not clear in the in the Constitution, in the statutes, and the laws, and all, it can eventually go to the Supreme Court for them to make a decision, and that's what they're for. That's the greater dispute. That's the one that everybody can get figured out down below, all the other judges. goes to the Supreme Court. Now, that's good if they were all godly people. Some are, probably, and some aren't. That's why we're to judge among ourselves according to God's Word, because if we live according to God's Word, we won't have to end up in their courts. Shouldn't have to anyway, okay? So, with that being said, I want us to I want us to turn to Ezekiel chapter 44 real quick. We're going to do a little moving around a little diff different different uh, today because I want us to look at some things here about where these things come from in the Brit Hadashai and the decisions that are made. Just give me a minute to get there on the do some things around here. Ezekiel chapter 44.
you know. Okay, I see what happened. Let's let's uh, let's start at verse twenty-three. Moreover, they shall teach my people, talking about the priests, those of the house of Israel, the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in a dispute, they shall take their stand to judge. They shall, shall judge it according to what? His ordinances. They shall also keep my Torah, my laws, my instructions, and my statutes in all my what appointed my moedim my specified time that my appointed feast take place and they are to sanctify set apart holy like we do today we, we're not working we cut off work we we decided we was going to honor god and keep his biblical sabbath so that's why we're here today here's his word my sabbath and why is it plural sabbath because why? There's more than just the weekly Sabbath. There's the extra seven Sabbaths, high Sabbaths, during the year in the spring, the four in the spring, and the three in the fall. Okay, so we see also Ezekiel's talking about this. Ezekiel's in agreement with what Jethro is telling Moses how he's supposed to handle this. Because Jethro was already a priest of Midian, even though he didn't know who Yod Vafe, the true God, was yet, until he met Moses. He had things obviously in order. He was running his priesthood in order and things must have been going very well for him all right now let's to turn to first timothy chapter three. First timothy chapter three it's not in your readings today but god told me to put it in the readings so that's what we're doing man First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three, beginning with verse one. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer or an elder, it is a fine work he desires to do. And again, I want you to understand it says man. It's referring to this office, this specific office is for a man only. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. Why was this put in there? Because back then some of the men had more than one wife. There's places today where the men have more than one wife. That disqualifies him from holding this office. Temperate, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. There's a lot of requirements. When you really get down to the nitty gritty and you add them all up, there's about 17 requirements to fit this office. And someone might say, well, in this day and time, nobody's gonna fit that office. No, that's not true. There's some of us who've been really bad in the past and God's raising us up. In fact, he's raising a bunch of you up right now to fit in this office. Some of you is probably already about there and some's real close and some still got a ways to go. Also not addicted to wine. You're not supposed to be addicted to wine, to alcohol, or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. You see all these things here and more that's over there? He must be one who manages his own household well. And some people that needs to be here today, they're, they're not here. I wish more people were here. Hearing all this stuff, everybody needs to hear it today. All of us men need to hear this today. I don't pick it on anybody. All of us need to hear it, including me. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Amen. We got to keep our children under control. We got to teach our children how to respect God's house, respect people, respect mom and dad, and we got to start when they're born. Uh, I know it's different and it changes, and you get, you know, you, as they get older, there's more things you have to do different, but you got to teach them from the beginning. Don't wait till they're 13. <laughs> if you wait to their teenager, all hell's going to break loose on you with what we're dealing with out here today. I'm telling you, it's going to take an act of God then. You waited too long. And God does have, perform miracles, and God does deliver. 
teenagers. Thank God. Amen. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the congregation, the community of Elohim, the Son of God? That's why we do it different here. That's why we don't do it like some churches and even some synagogues do. You've got to meet these qualifications. I have to meet these qualifications because that's what God said it was supposed to take place. Now, if we don't do it the way God said do it, guess what we're going to have? We're going to start having trouble. Amen. We're going to have, and then you can't, and you, and then you can't, well, you let so-and-so do it. Why can't I do it? Oh, well, that's different because that was my son. No, no, no. You, you, you see, I have seen this my whole life take place and, and tear bodies, communities apart because of partiality and not rendering just judgment across the board. So we want our men here to be men of God, walking in this order and teaching their family and teaching the ones that are discipling when they come in here. I want us to be filled with the Spirit of God, walking according to God's Word, where the Ruach HaKadosh is flowing in us, and when people walk in, the love and the discipline and the worship and the praise is there, and the power of God is there, and it changes people's lives. Amen. I don't care what the rest are doing. I'm concerned about what we're doing. I can't do nothing about them. I'm here. Amen? Amen. And not a new convert. Listen to this. I don't care how polished you are, a new convert. Well, that's what you got to stay, Rabbi Wayne. That's so-and-so. I know they just got saved, but they got a lot of money. They can give a lot. I don't care. I don't. I'm not. Look, God's going to provide what we need. It might be through them, but it ain't going to be because we... Oh, you're so cold. Come over here. You know, it might be the guy that comes in, in dirt and rags in the back. And you say, oh, man, put, let's put him in the back. Cause he smells bad. Let's put this one up here. I won't talk about you, brother. I'm sorry. But anyway, we get, are we getting the point here? Equal justice for all loving everybody wherever they're at. That they may, God may be able to work in them and change their life. Amen. Not a new convert, lest he become what? Conceited. And fall to the condemnation incurred by the devil. I'm not going to do that to a new person, to a new convert. I don't care how polished they are. I don't care how much knowledge they have. I don't care what's going on in their life because I would be, first of all, disobeying God and doing them a disservice and doing the whole community, the whole body here a disservice. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the congregation. We're really supposed to have a good reputation even outside the congregation. Not everybody's going to like us, you understand. That's not what it means. But we're, they're, they're supposed to know that when we leave here, we're not over at Johnny's Bar getting drunk and they see us. And we're not over at such and such a place telling profane jokes. They're going, listen, you can't fool the world. The world is, they know what, they what we're being watched. Not just God's watching us. We can't hide nothing from Him, but everybody's watching us. We need to live righteous before God. I know none of us are perfect, but we need to work on be thou holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. We're to be how do we be holy? Set apart, obey his word, live like this. And he must have a good reputation with those even outside the congregation or community, so that he may not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, deacons likewise, even deaconship must be men of dignity, not double tongued, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain. Same applies. Uh, those who are servants within within the body, but holding we're all servants, but a specific order. But holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And now here comes the part. Some people don't understand why I do what I do. Why is why why are you taking so long? Because I want you to be fully equipped in God. I want the ruach hakadosh to be so in you, and you know God's word before you start going out and trying to tell others, so that you don't get twisted and turned by the devil or which way but loose. It says, and let those also first be tested. Tested. Then let them serve as deacons or elders if they are beyond reproach. If you're here, we love you and we don't know you. And we want, I want everybody to be, all men, I would every man in here would be able to fulfill these roles. Amen. Every woman of God, teaching, witnessing, whatever that God has for us to do. But we, and, and listen ladies, this doesn't mean you're, you, you can sin and do what you want to because it's talking to men. <laughs> but this is the specific offices. You would be the same way with your husband. If you're, not the, if you're not holding your husband at all and being hospitable with him and backing him up, 
then he can't do the job God wants him to do. It, it, it really gives him a hard time from being able to do what God wants him to do. Ladies, love your husbands. Back him up. I didn't say you had to agree with everything that he believes and all. I said back him up. Pray to God about it. Okay? If, you, if you something you don't understand. So you see, and I'm going to read this last verse. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and of their households. Until I know that you are managing your household and don't think I don't see. Good. You, you would not yet be ready to fulfill that role because we want you to be doing that so that you can be a blessing to the body here as well as your family. So the practice test begins at your home first with your family and your children. Amen? Amen. Everybody okay with that? Nobody mad at me? God's word is not mine. I'm just, te I'm just telling you what he said for me to tell you today. Amen? Amen. All right, now let's go back. Let's go back where we left off. So you see Jethro, Jethro, the priest of Midian, gave Moshe some good advice. He told him how to set up the household of faith, how to bring about righteous judgment to the household of faith, and what was required for you to be a leader, whether you're an elder or whatever term we want to put on it today. Uh, you know, uh, rabbi is just an elder, a uh, teacher, uh, deacons, whatever we do. Uh, we're of the household of faith, and we all must obey by these, word, these words of God. Amen? Amen. Okay. Let's see where we left off here. Verse 22, I believe. And let them judge the people at all times. And let them, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves, uh, uh, they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. In other words, the reason we need men of God in eldership places here and all is because, really, when someone has a dispute and they're talking to you and you happen to be there with it, guess what? You should be able to take care of it if it's mine. If, it, if it's something that's a little complicated, I'm going to tell you, don't think that some disputes can get really complicated. I promise you, some of them can get really complicated, and you might need to come ask me for help. And there's times I have to go ask for help, too, to get so complicated. So, you know, that's just the way it is. But that's the ideal is that Everybody doesn't have to run up here to me and ask me because we got men and women here that can uh, judge rightly. Amen? Amen? If you do this thing, this is what it says, if you do this thing and Elohim so commands you, then you will be able to endure. And all these people also will go to their place in shalom, in peace. If we'll do it God's way, we can live in shalom. We can live in peace in our families and our communities. Amen? No matter what the world's doing. So Moshe listened to his father-in-law. Listen to this. Sons-in-laws, listen to your father-in-law. Why? Because Moshe did. All right? The reason why you have father-in-laws and fathers is because they're older than you. And not just because they're older than you, because they've been around longer than you and they haven't been through a lot of things you hadn't been through. And if you'll seek their wisdom and understanding, it'll save you a lot of hardship down the road. Well, I, I just believe I would do it my, learn my own way. All right, well, go ahead, hardhead. <laughs> learn your own way. Go ahead and cost yourself years of lost time and finances and hardship with your family and all. You know, because don't think people don't say that. I'm telling you, if you will submit yourself to God and do it the way God says, it'll save you a lot of hardship. Hallelujah. It'll bless your family. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Somebody's listening. Amen. So Moshe listened to his father-in-law. Moshe, oh, the great man of God, the only one that God ever spoke to face to face, listened to his father-in-law, this priest of Midian, that he needed to hear from Moses who the true living God was so he could get right with God. But he listened to his counsel because he had good counsel. Amen? Amen. So Moshe listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moshe chose able men, able men, those who qualified, in other words. We got the qualifications that was given back here in Torah. Uh, that's where they. That's how they knew it over in the new uh, Hadashah how to give the qualifications because they learned from Torah. All right, it came first. The Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, wasn't written first. It was letters to these congregations who were having problems, and Paul, Shaul, and the apostles had to bring them into order according to what the Torah and what God's 
requirement was is how to set the body in the house, our individual houses and our body, extended family in order according to God's yeah. word. Amen. 25. And Moshe chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and tens. Why is these different numbers? Because some can handle a certain amount. They're able, they're trained. Others can handle more. Others can handle more. God knows who can handle what. And they judged the people at all times. The difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, or Moshe. But every minor dispute they themselves would judge. Then Moshe bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went his way into his own land. Now, hallelujah, we're going to get into some interesting things. I, I think that part by itself is just the greatest lesson today before we even get into the smoke and the fire. The smoke and the fire, is, are y'all ready for some smoke and fire? Are you ready for some shaking, amen? Hallelujah, it's fixing to happen. It says in the third month of chapter 19 and verse 1, in the third month after the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, had gone out of the land of Misraim or Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When? The third month. Listen to me. The number three is showing up. Glory yeah. to God. Right. Somebody don't know what I'm talking about, but some of you do. Yeah. When you see number three show up every time, we always see that that is either uh, being resurrected from the dead or that it seems to be dead coming to life. Watch this. What happened on the third day? Yeshua rose from the grave, and he was dead in the grave. And we can see this played out through many. What about, what about Jonah, a type and picture of Yeshua the Messiah, the only sign he gave to the Jewish people who was questioning him if he was the Son of God? What happened on Jonah? He was spit out of the belly of the whale when? On the third day, he should have been dead, but he came out alive. Amen? So, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out for, from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Where are the people of Israel? They're camped in front of the mountain at Sinai. And Moshe went up to God. Went up. He, in the Hebrew it would be he ascended. He went up. He's going up high. You know, what about Yeshua? He what? Descended and ascended. We, we see this picture, a, a type and picture of uh, Moses and the Messiah. And Moshe, Moshe went up to Elohim, he ascended up, and Yodei Vafe, the Lord, called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Yaakov, or Jacob, and tell to the sons of Israel, or Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how more you on eagles' wings. You see, America was back then delivering sons of Israel, eagles' wings. Oh. Everybody wants to look for a sign of America in the Bible. And their same terminology is over there in the prophets. No, it has nothing to do with America. It's, it's a term he uses as a deliverance of eagles' wings to deliver in the house of Israel. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed hear this, if I F the little big word, if you will indeed obey, obey my voice, Shema Israel, hear and obey, hear and do my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. Amen. You know that through the Messiah today, if you're not in covenant with, you, with him, he's inviting you to hear his voice. To accept his blood atonement for your sins. Amen. And you can be his own possession. Amen. He can change your life today from what it's been if you're not pleased with the way it's been. Amen. Then you shall then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, yep. for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now here we have the whole house of Israel and the mixed multitude because the whole house of Israel were not just Jews or Hebrews. It was Gentiles there too. Oh, I know that surprises a lot of people. But a lot of Egyptians saw the hand of God and they said, Whoa, all of our gods have been destroyed and this is the true God. I, I think I see the hand writing, so to speak, on the wall. I'm going with these Hebrews, these Jewish people. I'm going to serve the one true living God. So they're all there at the mountain and, and, and he's telling them, look, 
I want you to be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if you will obey my voice and, and keep my covenant. This is before the golden calf incident. He literally wanted all of them to be priests. But because, and we'll study this as we get to the partial later on, not the David later on when it comes up, uh, we'll talk about that more, about the cause of the golden calf incident. They set the Levitical priesthood for a period of time until the restoration of the Messiah came and the Melchizedek priesthood, he, he put that back in order so that we could all be what he wanted them to be as the sons and daughters of Israel, what? All to be priests in the holy nation. And I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to give you a little information today. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moshe came and called the who? Elders, the men of the people, the elders of the people, and set before them all these words which Shodevathe had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, Listen, after he told them and the elders told them, this is the, this is the answer to the sons of Israel, the sons and daughters of Israel, B'nai Israel. All that Yodevath, the Lord, has spoken, we will do. They said, all he's spoken, we're going to do. They said it before they knew what it all was. <laughs> I'm serious. And Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yodevath. You know, we're in the beginning of Israel being betrothed to their bridegroom. Okay? At Mount Sinai. And Yodavah, the Lord said to Moshe, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud. Oh, I love the cloud. Lord God. Man, when the cloud appears, I'm, is this it? I didn't hear no shofar blow, though. It must not be. You know? Every time you see the cloud, God, you know, He was always showing up in the cloud. At, 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 the, at the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, a cloud by day to keep them, a fire by night, so they could see and be warm. Yeshua left it on the Mount of Olives in a cloud. And they were staring. And the angel said, why do you keep staring and glazing, uh, gazing up there? The Son of Man will come back in the same way that he left. And we know he's coming back in the cloud. The great show far sounds for the people of God. You know, it's all there. If we just get to know him better and read his word and listen to his voice, he'll begin to show us things that are just, ooh, hallelujah, to make the goosebumps of the Holy Spirit fall all over you. Because you'll get to know him in such a Man, just like my wife and I, we've been married for 43 years, and I get to know—I just know her more and more every day. I know more about how she thinks and all that. She knows more about how I think. We begin to say things. Uh, I'll start to say something. The same words come out of her mouth. It's awesome. It's not too late. Hallelujah. Oh, it's not too late. You know, no matter if you failed in the past, pick it up. Give it to God and, and move forward now. He'll do that for you. Amen. Hallelujah. So, let me read this again. So, y'all holding me up from reading all this. And then Yodavafe said to Moshe, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moshe told the words of the people to Yodavafe. Now, I'm going I'm to give up a little information in case we don't get there. But our Brit Hadashai reading, you come to reading today, is in Matthew. And it has to do in Matthew. Uh, but actually, the first part of it is not supposed to technically be read in our parsha, but we really need to read it if we get there. If not, you need to because we're dealing, we're dealing with God on the mountain. We're dealing with Moses on the mountain. We're dealing with the Ruach HaKadish, the Shekinah, the power of Shavuot, Pentecost taking place. Do you understand what's happening here is Pentecost and the giving of the Torah is fixing to happen the first time. A lot of people think all that just took place when the church was born over here in, in Acts. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. That was the first Shavuot or Pentecost. Pentecost is a Greek term we use for the English term. Uh, Shavuot is the Hebrew term. Uh, and that's what took place in, in Acts when the Ruach HaKadish, the Holy Spirit, was given to those, quote, in the upper room. They all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him utterance. And the power of God was moving and over 3,000 Jewish people came to faith that day. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. Do you understand those 3,000 Jewish people that came to faith? It's because of their faith and they're sacrificing their lives for Messiah, for God, and for the kingdom that you and I have salvation today through Messiah. Amen. It was Jewish people that we, a lot of times, flip our nose up at. We're anti-Semitic about. They gave their lives for the good news of the gospel. So we as Gentiles, Amen. those who are Gentiles and those who are Jewish, Amen. even the Jewish brethren first, and the Jews first, and the Gentiles, would hear the good news Amen. and be able to be brought part of the kingdom of God, the house of Israel. This is for somebody today. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.
Then Moshe told the words, I'm going to read it again, to the people. Uh, 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 Moshe told the words of the people to Yodavafe the Lord. Then Yodavafe also said to Moshe, Go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow. Now we need to pay attention to this. This is real important. Don't miss this. It's not just some words on a piece of paper. It says, Then Yodavafe said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. A purification is taking place. A consecration is taking place for the people. And also let them wash their garments. They're even washing their garments. The priest, they're being, they're, you know, they're going through a mitna, so to speak. A baptism, if you want to use that terminology. Get prepared to meet the creator of the universe. Yes. Amen. And it says, today and tomorrow. And let them be ready for the third day. What's going to happen on the third day? Oh, what it says over in the, over in the, in, in the I think it's Zephaniah, or, or, or one of them anyway, that, no, it's in Hosea. Hosea, what did it say? It said, two days I will rend you, but on the third day I will raise you up. Amen. You understand Israel was totally out of the land for two days, but in 1948, they came back as a nation. Amen. They were rent. They were persecuted. They were run from country to country. And finally, the, 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 the finality of the Holocaust, and some of them gave up. They didn't believe God was real because of all the persecution, but the ones that did, did. And God, through the smoke of the Holocaust, raised up the nation Israel, of which we're a part of. And that's only the beginning. It's not completed yet. Why? Because there's still a lot of Jews and non-Jesus in the kingdom of God that's at the four corners of the earth witnessing for him today. But one day soon, and I believe in our time, he's coming back for the rest of us. Amen. And we have an inheritance, an internal inheritance in that land over there for those who are in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. If you're in the kingdom of God, you have an inheritance waiting for you today. Amen. Amen. But in the meantime, we got work to do. we got to train our children. we got to live our lives. What did he tell them when they went into the Babylonian captivity? Yeah. Build houses. Educate your children. I know I'm paraphrasing it. Some put a few things there so we can understand it. Do all these things until the time of your punishment is up. Live your life normal until it's time for you to go back to Jerusalem. So, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yodavah, the Lord, will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch you, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast. What? What's happening? A ram's horn. What did it say in the last day when Messiah returned? There will be a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump, the ram's horn, and God would sound, and Messiah would descend. You see the picture here? Oh, glory to God, it's everywhere. Man, give him praise. Let's, let's give, give him a hand of praise right now. Hallelujah. They shall come up on the mountain. So Moshe went down. He descended. He went up, he ascended, and he descended. He did this about a bunch of times. So Moshe went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning they were, that there was thundering and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud shofar sound, trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Man, I'm going to tell you something. That mountain was shaking. There was lightning and dark clouds. There was volcanic type activity going on. The power of God was all around it. But would you have been afraid? Would you have been shaken? And the Bible says... That on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost, they were all in one mind and one accord. And suddenly there came, what? Wow. A loud noise, a shaking, a violence. You go look at the Hebrew, it's about a shaking, a noise. And it was cloven tongues of fire. We see the fire and the lightning. You see what's happening? The Spirit of God, of Elohim. God is descending and it, and on that mountain. And we see Him in the book of Acts doing the same thing. And this time, He's not just going to give us His... His word and all, just one time and, and one voice, but and, and right on tablets of stone, but He's writing it in our hearts every day, isn't He? Amen. As we trust in Him. Amen. Amen. And Moses brought the people 
out of camp to meet Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. He's already told them, here's the way you're going to do it. Here's the order I want done in. You can't, you can't approach me anyway. You can't come up on the mountain. You'll get killed. You'll die. He's, he warned. He's given a warning. Here's, here's where you come, and here's where you stop. I'm a holy God. You don't just treat me any way you want to. I'm going to let you come so far. Now, we've got to understand something here. Do you understand that when he talked to the patriarchs, he never talked to them in this way. But this is the whole nation of Israel now. He's, he's showing them something. He's showing them how he, who he really is and how powerful he is and how he's to be revered and respected. Too many times we don't revere him like we're supposed to. And we don't teach our children to revere him like we're supposed to. Now the Mount now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yodi Bafe descended. Who descended? See, Moses has been ascending and descending. Now the creator of the universe is descending upon it in fire. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. That can be good and bad for me and you. If we obey him and the fire of his spirits in us, that can be good. He can use us for his glory and lead many people to Messiah. If we disobey him, it can be bad. He can consume us because of our disobedience till we die. We saw that with the two sons of Aaron. When they offered strange fire, didn't obey God. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yodi Vafe, the Lord, descended upon it in fire, and it smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. Violently. When the sound of the trumpet, the great shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And Yodi Vafe, the Lord, came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And Yodi Vafe, the Lord, called Moshe to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Moses ascended up. Then Yodi Vafe spoke to Moshe. Go down, warn the people, lest they break through the, to, to Yod Vav Hay to gaze, and many of them perish. And also, also let the priests who come near to Yod Vav Hay consecrate themselves, lest Yod Vav Hay break out against them. Even the priests had to consecrate themselves. Even the priests were allowed to go to a certain place only. And Moshe said to Yod Vav Hay, the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou didst warn us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then Yodi Bafe, the Lord, said to him, Go down and come up again. Descend and ascend again, and you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to Yodi Bafe, lest he break forth on them. So Moshe went down to the people and told them. So, Mount Sinai is quaking, fire, lightning. God's moving mightily. And we're going to start on chapter 20. And he's fixing to speak some words to the people of Israel. Some commandments. Some misvote. Commandments. Chapter 20 and verse 1. 20 and verse 1. Did Elohim God spoke all these words? Devarim. That's the Hebrew for it. That's the last book of the Torah. Deuteronomy, we call it in English. Devarim is words. Then Elohim spoke all these words, his words, saying, I am, oh hallelujah, Yodei Vavhe, the Lord your Elohim, your God, who brought you out of the land of slavery and bondage, persecution, the land of Egypt, out of that house of slavery. You shall have no other gods Elohim is the Hebrew word, and a lot of people get off on dog trails with that word because it's the same word for the one true living God, and it's the same word used for false gods. And they get shipwrecked by learning the one or two words of Hebrew and thinking that they all got a revelation and want to go out and tell everybody you got to quit saying that word because it's pagan. <laughs> I, believe me, I've dealt with it more than one time. So we have to be careful with when it comes to, to words, but this is... This is uh, Talking about no other gods, no other Elohim, false gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, Yod Vav, the Lord, your Elohim, your God, am a jealous Elohim, a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. He's a jealous Elohim, a jealous God. Listen, he's jealous for his bride. Amen. Husbands, do you really want your wife to have another date with somebody else besides you? No. You going to put up with that kind of mess? You're jealous for your wife, right? Wives should be jealous for their husbands. 
Amen. We're not to have anybody else in our life. That, that's, a, that's a personal intimate relationship with one another. And yet we see it happening all the time today. We see it happening in the religious community. Divorce is just as high, if not a little bit higher in the religious community than it is in the world. Secular world. But showing, but here's the good news, but showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my mitzvot, my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yodevafe, your Elohim, your God, in vain. For Yodevafe, the Lord, will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And a lot of people believe and have been taught in the Christian community, in other communities as well, that that's saying GD, and y'all know what I mean. And it can be, but it's way far more than that. It really is. It's being living an unholy life and claiming to be a believer. It's profaning, not obeying the commandments, and, and not keeping them, and proclaiming to be a believer. Do you realize that's profaning the name of God when you disobey His commandments? It really is. Remember, and this is what He says after He says that. First thing He says is remember the Shabbat, the Sabbath day, to keep it kadosh. The Hebrew word for holy is kadosh. A better English word than holy for the Hebrew word kadosh would be set apart. Sanctified in the book of Genesis. Kadosh, holy. Sanctified, set apart. Why is it set apart? Because this is a special day. It's different than the other six. It says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. In other words, I'm going to give you six days to do your labor. Do what you want to do on it. Play your golf. Work your job. <laughs> Ladies go and buy all the dresses at, at, at uh, Steinmart or whatever. You know, do that. But that's it. Six days you got time to do that in. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yodim the Lord your God. It's a set apart, a holy set apart day. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. But isn't that just for those Jewish people? Isn't that commandment just for those Jewish people? For all the nations. For all the nations. God gave it to everybody. And you know, it's interesting because for some of the churches today that will actually put their Ten Commandments upon the walls, and there's one in Milton that actually does it and has a stone. Like, you know, like the two tablets. What does it usually always say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They leave the rest of it off. Why? Because it would be condemning to them for putting it up. Because it tells you plainly that the Sabbath day is the Sabbath day. God has not changed His mind. Somebody said, well, that's in the New Testament. I mean, that's in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. Well, chapter 4 in the book of Hebrews in the Brit Hottest Shire, the New Covenant, says there therefore remains the Sabbath rest of the people of God. Be careful that you enter that rest Unless you fall short of it like they did out in the wilderness when they disobeyed me. Well, I thought they kept the Sabbath in the wilderness. They kept it in a physical way because they knew if they got caught not keeping it, they'd be stoned. But inwardly, they were not keeping it. You understand, you can keep it outwardly and not keep it inwardly. You see, so if you're keeping it outwardly and the whole time you're rebelling inwardly, you only do it because you're afraid of the stone hitting you in the head, knocking you out, or killing you. <laughs> then you're really not keeping it spiritually. You're still not obeying God. That's right. So it works both ways. There's a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect. The Bible says in James, faith without works is dead. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. In other words, God created Adam in the garden of Gan Eden or Eden, and he was perfect laying there, created him out of the dust of the earth. He was dead as a doornail. Until it said until he <laughs> breathed the ruach, the breath, his breath of life, and he became a living soul. We're all dead until we're spiritually reborn again, and his breath is breathed into us, and we become new and living in him. And as we learn his truth, then we need to begin to walk in his truth. We're all at different stages in our lives. Some people don't know about these truths yet, but they really have accepted the Messiah. Got a lot of Christian friends and brothers who have, but they've been taught wrong doctrine for years and years, and they're actually doing their best from their heart to keep the truth. Well, 
I'm not their judge. God is. And I believe they're going to be okay if they're really doing what they know to do. The Bible says that him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him it is sin. It's when revelation of God's true word comes to you about things that you've been doing that's not right and you clearly understand it that you become accountable then. See? God's so awesome and He's so just. He takes us right where we're at and loves us right where we're at. And, and He doesn't and he, and he applies mercy and grace when we need it when we're not where we need to be yet. I mean, it's just Amen. unfathomable, His love for us. He loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us, to redeem us from our sin and bondage. Do you think He's just waiting for some mistake for us to make so He can squash us? No. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yodi Baha, your Elohim. In it you shall not do any work. You nor your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner. Who stays with you? Who's a sojourner? A Gentile. Not a household of faith who's come and join himself, so are, 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 are journeying with them. What does it say? It says they're supposed to keep it too. Oh, you mean the Gentiles? Yeah. Because the house of Israel has always been made up of Jews and Gentiles. Amen. If you include that Amen. modern terminology, Hebrews and un-Hebrews. All nations go in. Amen. So the reality of it is, is whoever chooses to accept the atoning blood of Messiah, whether a Jew or a Gentile, because the Jewish people too, even though they were God's chosen people, they got to accept Messiah too. That's right. Amen. They, just because they're born Jewish don't make them saved, so to speak, That's if you want to use that modern terminology. Right. Redeem, they got to come to Messiah just like the Gentile does. So that's what makes up the whole house of Israel. The commonwealth of the house of Israel, all the Jewish people, the Jewish Messiah, all those that believe, who shared the good news of the gospel, gave their lives to the Gentiles, who came to faith, and they came to faith, they were grafted into the olive tree according to Shaul, Paul, who gets a bad rap, nonstop all the time, claims he changed being a Jew, a Benjamite from the tribe of Ben, a, 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 a Jew, a Benjamite from the tribe of Benjamin, never changed his mind. Do you understand that Paul was in the Sanhedrin. There's no evidence that he was ever kicked out of Sanhedrin because he would have had to violate the Torah even though he accepted the Messiah and the law didn't like it. Amen. He taught the Torah to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He showed no partiality. If he had showed partiality, then he would have been guilty of what he accused Peter of being guilty of. He jumped in Peter's mess for not for eating with the Gentiles with the Jewish people from Jerusalem. The hierarchy wasn't around. When they came down, he withdrew from them. Paul got on to him. Peter had an issue. We know that from the dream and the vision and the sheep being let down and had God talk to him about it then. So you see, it's for everybody. The whole house of Israel is made up of Jews and Gentiles, but the Jewish people had a distinction that God chose them to carry the Torah, the words of God, to keep it and protect it for the people. And it was their job to deliver it to everybody, whosoever will. But the seventh day is a Sabbath. Read it again, verse 10. Of Yodi Vafe, the Lord your God, in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days, Yodi Vafe, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. This, was God tired? Did he, was, is that why he rested? Because he was tired? No. no. He's, he's setting things in order. He's setting things in place. That this is a special day, a time when... He wants to commune with you and I. He wants us to put the world aside and He wants to be in a relationship with us just like He was with Adam and Hava or Eve. And rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yodhi Vafi, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it Kadosh, made it holy. There's not a single day and He reiterates over and over again which day the Sabbath is on. It's on the seventh day over and over again from Genesis all the way to the New Testament and the prophets and all the way into the New Testament of Hebrews, which day it is. Because he wants to commune with you. He loves us so much that he wants special time with us. Because he said if we'd honor him and obey his commandments, which means keeping the Sabbath, we'd be a special people to him, a special treasure to him. Amen. Don't you want to meet with the creator of the universe, the one who gave you breath, gives you and I breath to breathe, and have a whole day with him on a special day like today, and be able to sit here and read his word and hear his voice as we because his word is his voice yes. see it's not my voice it's his word yes. that he's using my voice to speak it's his voice because i'm reading his word not mine Amen. honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged listen to me young people listen to this 
Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which shall devolve hey, the Lord your God gives you. You want to live a long life? Honor your mom and dad. I didn't say that everything they did was right, but you to respect them and honor them. You're going to cut your life short if you show disregard and disrespect for them. Amen. You shall not m murder. The re reality of that's a more of a proper he English rendering. Most of your Bibles probably say thou shalt not kill. There's a difference between killing and murder. Amen. Thou shalt not murder. You shall not commit <laughs> adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet, the shafar, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then said, then they said to Moshe, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. They were fearful. They were hearing the very words of God from the mountain. Right, amen. Yes, hold it to later. I'll, talk, I'll answer it later. But they were hearing the very words of God from the mountain speaking to them. These ten words, if you want to call it, that's referred to as the ten words. And they were scared. Moses... Would you just go up there and, and, and let God tell you the rest of it and come and tell us? That's really it. <laughs> you think about that. And Moshe said to the people, Do not be afraid, for Elohim has come in order to test you, and in order that, you, that the fear of Him may remain in you, and that you may not sin. Now, you know, it's, it's not fear in the way we think of it. It's a fear of, of He's our Abba, but we're to reverence Him. We're to respect Him. We're to do things the way He asked us to do. Yeah. We're to be in awe. He's our Abba Father, you know. Yeah. And He loves us. But we don't have to be afraid that, you know, He's just going to be mean to us and treat us badly and all that. However, He has to honor His Word. If you disrespect Him, there can be consequences. Amen. So the people stood at a distance while Moshe approached the thick cloud where Elohim was. So what's Moshe doing? He's ascending up again. You know, Moses must have been quite an athlete to be 80 years old. <laughs> Hallelujah, man, I'm going to get in shape. I still got hope. He was 80 years old, man. He was going up and down that mountain. My goodness. Then Yodavavah said to Moshe, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You're not supposed to do that with silver and gold. You're supposed to give it to me. No, I'm just kidding. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall not make an altar of earth for me, and you shall, you shall, excuse me, you shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings and your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you if you do it His way, and if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stone. For if you weld or yield your tool on it, you profane it. What's the point here? We need to do it God's way because we're so guilty of every time we want to do it things our way, we end up profaning what God's put out there. So he says, here's how I want you to do it. I don't, I don't want you to do, I don't want you to cut the stones, I don't want you to use my natural stones. If you don't use the dirt, use, use the natural stones. You shall not go up by the steps to my altar for your nakedness may be exposed on it. Turn quickly, and we'll start in some of this up here in a little bit. Exodus, I mean Isaiah 6 and 1. I'm going to get this quick now because it's sake of time. Six one, Isaiah 6-1. Six, I'm going to read some of it. In the year of King Uzziah's death I saw... Adonai the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. We see the language here, the same type of language that the prophet Yeshiyahu or Isaiah is using. That's in the book of Revelation. And one called out to another and said, Kadosh, 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 or holy, 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 is Yodavavhe, the Lord of hosts. 
The whole earth is full of his kabod, his glory, and the foundations and the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, Father. And what's happening here? The same thing, the power, the shaking eye of God is coming in. And even the door frames in the temple, the posters shaking, God's presence and power. And, and Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen who? The king, Yodevah, pay of host. Who's the king? Yeshua is the king. But Yeshua, Yodevah, pay of host. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Yeshua's atoning blood sacrifice covers us and cleanses us, fills us with his spirit, removes the profane speech that we have, and puts his words in our mouth. Then I heard the voice of Adonai the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Are we saying it today? God's calling us. Are we willing to say, Here I am, send me. Purify my lips, cleanse me. I want to do your will. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not proceed. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. And this is where it's set for a lot, of, a lot of religious communities today. This is where they're at. Understand and return to me and be healed. What does it mean to return to do Teshuvah? Repentance. How do we return to Him? Teshuvah, to repent of our backslidden condition, of our dull ears, our eyes that have become dim, our ears that don't hear His words. Even though a lot of times the pastor or the rabbi or the teacher is speaking to them, we've got our minds on the Super Bowl or we're looking at our cell phones and we're playing games and all. If you're doing that when the Word of God in here is going forth like that, this, I'm going to be honest with you, it's applying to you. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. If you're doing it, your mind ain't on God. Years have become, because if you're not hearing these words of God that can change your life and you're doing other things, you're fitting in this category. Just repent and turn to Him. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. Amen. He's waiting for all of us. Amen. Amen. Then I said, Lord, how long? And He answered, until seas are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desert, desolate. Then Yodi Bapai, the Lord, has removed men far away. Diaspora, which is what happened to Israel. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And yet, and yet, oh, this is the good news. Hallelujah. Because this happened to Israel. Yet there will be a tenth portion, the remnant. Do you understand those who are keeping the commandments of God and their faith in Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, that they're the remnant people? They're the bride of Messiah? They're, they're the ones that have oil in their lamps, looking for His return, paying attention? Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning, like a terabith or an oak, whose stump remains when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. The holy seed is its stump. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and uh, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Armenians have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then Yodevah, the Lord, said to Yeshiahu, our Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son, uh, Sher Jasub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah, because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabel as king in the midst of it. Thus says out of Elohim, the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on this for time. Let's go to the, because uh, I really want to talk about Matthew a few minutes before we close. Matthew chapter 5, the Brit Hashai reading today. And for those of you who are new for the first time, what we do in this partial reading every week 
is we read from the Torah, and we read from the Nevi'im or the prophets, and we read from the Brit Hadashah. And we, and we tie all this together so that people can see that uh, we're not just, you know, so many times people hear the word Torah, 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 they don't understand that, you know, we're not, we're trying to bring people back under legalism. No, we're trying to give them the foundational understanding so they, when they go through that and the prophets and the Brit Hadashah, they will really understand what the Brit Hadashah is saying instead of what they've been told it said. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. And we're supposed to start at verse 17. If you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'm going to read through this first part because we've been we've done seen the shaking, the shaking out of the temple of the Spirit of God coming in. Uh, and, and yes, Yahoo and Isaiah, we've seen it at Mount Sinai for the house of Israel. And here we have Messiah almost 2,000 years ago in, in Israel. It says in verse 1, And he saw the multitudes. He went up on the mountain. He's going up on the mountain, Yeshua. Jesus, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began teaching them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You gotta be a, you gotta be in the kingdom. You gotta be born again. You gotta be in covenant to be a son of God and to be a peacemaker. You understand that this is a spiritual aspect of the commandments and how they're living them out in this order. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you being persecuted by your family, by friends? Are they making fun of you? It's okay. You know, it's okay. Count it is but joy that you had an opportunity to be persecuted. Not because you want to be persecuted. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't like any pain. I don't like people saying bad things to me. But a joy because I obeyed God and I honored Him. And I, and I did it in a way that it was because I cared for them and yet they're persecuting me for it. Blessed are you when, you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad. What does it say? Rejoice and be glad. Say it with me. Rejoice and be glad. It doesn't matter about the circumstances. We need to rejoice and be glad. We need to get up in the morning and say, this is the day that Adonai has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't care if it's cloudy and raining. I don't care if the sun's shining bright. This is the day He's made. Amen? Hallelujah. Rejoice and be glad. Yes. Hallelujah. And for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If they persecuted them, they're going to persecute you and I. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled under by the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Do we not understand that Yeshua, the light of the world, living in us, makes us a part of the menorah? We're to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth? Are we acting like it? If we're not, we need to. Hallelujah. Amen. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And now here's where the parson started to say. After all, he said all this. He knew what was going to happen. He knows what's been happening for the last 1,800 years in the religious community. How that, well, Messiah came. He fulfilled the Torah. He died and rose again, and he did away with that. I'm starting a new thing. Can you imagine the Word of God dying on a tree for your and my sins redemption, lived the Torah, the law, the Word of God perfectly, and died and rose again and said, I've changed my mind about my Word. No Can you See, He is the Word of God. He cannot lie. Amen. You understand if he had to counsel certain things out of his word, he would have counseled himself out. That's right. Because he is the olive and the top of the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Amen. So he said this so everybody would clearly understand in the Brit Hadashah, because the new covenant is what's used to quote do away with certain things of God. And most of the time they use Paul's writings to try to do it. 
Do not think the Messiah self. Do not think that I have come to abolish or do away with the Torah, the law in English, the instructions of God, or the writings of the Naveen, the prophets. Do not think that I've come to do away with any of that. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, well, see, God fulfilled it. It's, it's finished. No, that's not what it means in Hebraic understanding. It means to bring it to its fullness, its clarity, so you can really understand because the scribes and the Pharisees and some of the Sadducees had perverted it, had put weights and bounds and legalism on it, had added stuff to it. The people couldn't even clearly see the whole word of God anymore. They couldn't even hear. Oh, my goodness. How are we going to keep this? I gotta have two refrigerators in my house so I can separate the dairy and the milk. I can't afford two. I can only afford one. Now the reality of it is that wouldn't apply back then because they didn't have refrigeration. That would apply today. But the point is, is we get legalism confused with God's word in the Torah. And let me say this: there's nothing wrong with having two refrigerators if that's what you want to do. It's not forbidden in the Torah. It's only a problem when if you're Jewish. Or you're non-Jewish, you're at the household of faith, a Gentile, you want to do that because you feel that a conviction for somehow to do that, you can do it. Just don't go tell your brother the Word of God says you've got to do it too because it doesn't tell you that. You see? If you want to go further on with God, if you want to get, if you want, you know, it's up to you. Don't put it on somebody else. It's God's Word. Don't put legalism because when you put something that God did not specifically order in His commandments, on somebody else, then it becomes legalism. Amen. God's word is never legalism. His Torah, keeping his Sabbaths, all these things, eating kosher, they are not legalism. They are for your blessing. If you want to walk in the you don't have to walk in all the blessings. You can go ahead you can go ahead and do all the things against God's word you want to and suffer the consequences. And and you know, as long as you don't reject him and all that, you may still even be saved. You may even end up in the kingdom, but you might end up there early because you may die young because you walked in disobedience and you paid the price for it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, the oil spill, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke. Now let me tell you what that means in, in, in Hebraic understanding. The smallest letter in the Hebrew is the yod. It's the yod. Or the stroke. Those are the little marks with little crowns that decorate the Torah scroll and the letters. He's saying to us, let me, let me make this clear to you so that you and I will clearly understand. Let me tell you, not even the smallest letter nor the marks, the crowns, all the letters are going to be done away with. That's right. I want you to understand, not one thing my words are saying yesterday, today, and forever. I don't change anything. He says, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law which is the Hebrew word Torah, right. until all is accomplished. Well, maybe it's all been accomplished. Well, let's see. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments. Now listen to this carefully. The least of the commandments. We're not going to get into arguing right now. We don't have time on which one is the least. But whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So the declaration here is to the teachers of the word of God who's doing away with God's commandments, changing them to other days and times. And the Bible says when Anthem, the spirit of Anthem Messiah would come, he would seek to do what changed times and laws. Whose times and laws? God's times and laws. His commandments, his days of worship, and all those things. It's the spirit of Antichrist. But at, at, at the very least, if, you, if you're making it into the kingdom of heaven and you've been teaching people to do away with some of these, you're going to be considered the least in the kingdom. I don't know about you. I've been least long enough in this world. I don't want to be least in the kingdom of God when I stand before Messiah. Okay? So it says, whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called, whoever what keeps and, look, keeps, Shema Israel, hears and does them, the mitzvah, the commandments, and teaches others to do them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm holding on to that, glory to God. When I stand before him that I won't be there empty-handed, I've done my very best to teach the truth. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter how much religious education you have and how much how much uh, Mishnah, uh, 
or Talmud you know. It doesn't matter what theological teachings you had in the Christian church from the greats or whatever, wherever you're going. None, unless, unless your righteousness, which is God's righteousness, obedience to His commandments surpasses all that, you got a problem. It's a serious problem. It says in 21, you have heard it said that the ancients, and we're, going, we're, we're getting close to winding it up, you have heard it said that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, uh, Raka, which uh, means empty head or good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever shall say, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell or Guyana, the lake of the, the Guyana fire. If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. It didn't say that you had something against him, even if he has something against you and you know it. You have a duty to be the better man, to obey God's word and to go and try to bring reconciliation. Okay? It, well, what if, what, if he, what if he or she doesn't receive it? That's not your problem. If you go and you do your best in a loving kind of hard spirit to bring rec- then you've gotten free now you can go back and give your offer were they were they accepted or rejected it's not your problem it's now in god says you've done what you needed to do and you continue to pray for them make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way in order that your opponent may not deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison oh but i'm right i'm right and he's wrong i ain't doing it He's going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to let the judge figure it out. Well, you go ahead. If you can fix it before you get to the judge, though, you'll be better off. Right. Chances could be in your favor. Even if you have to, even if you're right, and it's better for you to accept wrong, to let him have his way, just to get over with, go on and do it. You know, let's turn the other cheek. You ought to deal with that person. Amen. And he'll bless you for doing it. It may not feel like it right now, but he will. Truly I say to you, you shall not come out of there until you have paid up the last sin. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. What is the deal here? I thought that, why? listen, why is all this coming after Messiah said, I'm not even doing away with the yod or the shrug of the Torah, the written word. Why is he now getting into all these spiritual things? Why is he taking it deeper? Well, I've never committed adultery with anyone in my life. But he's saying, well, if you look there with us, you did it. I've never murdered anybody. But if you go out there and you lasan some rock, lasan, speak evil, the evil tongue against people and tear their character down, you've murdered them. You might not have stuck a knife in or shot with a gun, but you murdered them. Do you understand why there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament? quote the Old Testament, you get it, the Tanakh, and there's a thousand fifty, most Christians have a, almost a conniption when you tell them that, because they're always saying, there's no way we can keep 613, but there's a thousand fifty in the Brit Hadash Shah, and you can because he takes it from just the outward to the inward and enhances it, which causes it to be more depth, more commandments, more responsibility, you see, and if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. If somebody trips, don't reach over and tear your eye out. I'll be carrying you to the hospital today. But there's a point here I want to make in a minute. Okay? Yes, get, you, get you woke for a moment. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for the whole body to go into hell. Let me say this. Let's look at this. See, the very first thing we're going to do is put this literally to our physical body. This is the body of Messiah here. That's right. All of us. Amen. Some of us are hands, some are foot, some are eyes. Right. Sometimes we have people in the body that slides in and they start doing things and they don't get right and they're becoming, trying to drag you into it to cause you to stumble. It's better for you to deal with it if you can't get fixed and go through the Matthew process to cast them out than to have them to destroy, cause your hand to be cut. You're about to cut your hand off. 
You understand why I'm up? This is how we need to understand this. Everybody get this? That's why there's discipline in the body of Messiah. And of course, when that's done, we do it with the hopes that there will be restoration because we still pray for that hand that we had to cut off and put outside the body. We pray for that, that eye that had to be torn out and put outside the body for restoration because we need that eye. We need that hand. We all need each other. So it's always about restoration.